Steve, who is out today. And right now we have a major controversy about Obamacare. Yes, once again, it looks as if Obamacare is in trouble, and it looks as if there is a great deal of debate as to whether or not it will be ready for prime time, which begins October 1st, when the exchange is open and the uninsured will be trying to buy health insurance. With us is Tom Miller, who is a resident fellow of the American Enterprise Institute and a longtime expert on health care. Thanks for being with us, Tom. Pleasure to be with you, John. Uh, the news today is that uh, it's only six weeks to go to October 1st, the start of Obamacare, and just now the Department of Health and Human Services, I call it the Department of Health and Human Suffering, has announced that they're going to release $67 million for navigators. And these aren't people to pilot the ship. These are people who are going to sit down and hold the hand of the uninsured as they try to sort through all the health insurance options they hope they will find on the Obama websites and buy something. And there's also n new controversy with the navigators because apparently it's not clear if there are even going to be criminal background checks on these people, even though they'll have access to the most sensitive tax information, information on your Social Security records, information on your veteran department records if you happen to have served in our armed forces. And 13 state attorneys general, uh, these are the chief law enforcement officers of their state, have sent a letter to Secretary Sebelius at HHS saying we have grave concerns about the privacy issues here, grave concerns about identity theft, grave concerns whether or not this program will be ready to work. And Tom, I wanted to, we're going to go over a lot of what is happening with Obamacare, but maybe you could comment just briefly on whether or not people really should be worried about this Navigators program and its late start. Okay, I, I think it's a legitimate concern. It varies from state to state. Some states, I think, have even tried to insert some of their own standards uh, on uh, who could be a navigator or what type of screens or background checks will go through. But there's going to be a lot of slack uh, in the program, particularly because so much of this is uh, such a scramble, such a push to uh, get people enrolled by any means necessary uh, that you're going to have a knock lot and, of... It's going to be knock and drag, just like the 2012 election. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, th th that's all true. So I, I think the attorney generals are, are right to express their concern. Uh, you know, part of it is also the the overreach of the law doesn't have the resources to pull it off. So another announcement today was trying to find some type of funding to uh, do these type of navigators or enrollment for it. Uh, the interesting thing is they really don't have the funding for the federally facilitated or federally run exchanges compared to the state run exchanges. They've got a lot of grants to. Uh, pump money into the states are more enthusiastic about it, but among more than 30 states, they're having a little trouble coming up with people to uh, get anybody, anybody on the ground to uh, knock on doors and get people interested in something they'd like rather go into hiding and, and, and avoid. Well, well, Tom, actually, what is what are the navigators exactly going to be doing? How do they reach their so-called client base? Are they going to go door to door to people and say, <laughs> do you have health insurance? Would you like some? I have an app laptop here. What are they going to be well, doing? I, well, I, I think the, the, the first requirement will be to get them, in, uh, you know, get, get them enrolled to vote, and then the rest will be. Well, negotiated. actually, Tom, you're, you're not you're not far from that. The state I of know. California, Secretary of State Deborah Bowen, a Democrat, has announced that she's partnering with the Navigators Program in California, and one of the yeah. things they're going to be doing, along with signing up people for health insurance, is signing them up to register to vote. So you're not far off the mark at all. Well, they're moving from motor voter to emergency room voter. I think. <laughs> at the next stage. Keep, th keep still, that one. That's a good a pulse, one. If you have a pulse and a heartbeat, uh, right. we'll be able to In fact, and we're responsible for at least keeping the pulse going. That's right. That's right. Uh, look, I mean, all this is, is jamming in, and we, although we think of October 1 as uh, the, I would say it's the off-Broadway opening of uh, what will be a, a short play, uh, that, that whole process is actually extends for almost six months, so they're going to have a lot of snafus and scrambles at the early going, and they're hoping to just stay on their feet in order to, you know, line up, uh, they're hoping to get seven to eight million people, and their bigger problem is being able to get uh, young people who are relatively healthy and really would not be inclined to overpay for their health care to somehow sign up for this. And I think that's where the struggle is going to be. Actually, the reason they need these young people in the health care exchanges is because somebody has to pay for the expansion exactly. of health care for older right. people. Can you explain how that works? <laughs> well, <laughs> this is. Or doesn't it, work. It may, it, it may work in theory, it a little breaks down in practice. 
uh, the, the concept is uh, part of it is the it's not full community rating, but it's what's called adjusted community rating, where uh, people who are older who will be much more expensive to cover and have higher claims, there, there's a limit on how much uh, more you can charge their premiums under the law. It's roughly a three to one age band. In addition, uh, with what's called guaranteed issue or no pre-existing conditions, you'll tend to have the people most likely to go into these subsidized exchanges are people who are going to be uh, less healthy. Uh, so in order to make that all work, you have to get a lot of other folks who will pay higher premiums uh, and not use as much health care uh, to make it all supposedly blend over. Now, at the same time, they'll tell all the people who are healthy and uh, they didn't really have to pay those high premiums because because they'll be subsidized. The taxpayers will pay it, so it's a little bit of a shell game to imagine that no well, one's paying for what's going to be a more expensive system. Well, the bottom line uh, for supporters of Obamacare is they say, well, you know, all these costs that people say they're going to have dumped on them because of higher insurance premiums that we're right. seeing in some states. You're forgetting about the other part of the equation, which is there'll be these wonderful subsidies that kick in exactly. up to 400 yep. percent of the poverty l level. Right. So. Even if even if you're young and you're not you know right. not particularly going to be sick, aren't you going to be subsidized? So you're really not going to pay that much for this new brand new health insurance. And, and we, we we heard that in entitlement programs as well. So young people are also paying for those, which is part of their their, their long term tab. Uh, yeah, it, it's a miracle in which everybody somehow pays less. Yet somehow there must be some higher costs somewhere that are being picked up elsewhere by. Uh, either rich people or people who don't know what's going on. Uh, the, you know, eventually the carousel stops, and it turns out that everybody has a different set of costs than they originally imagined. But, but that's the pretense in order to get this launched. Now, Tom, uh, the one thing I hear people say over and over again is, I don't understand any of these numbers, but I do remember President Obama's promise that if you're happy mm -hmm. with your doctor, you can keep him. If you're happy with your health insurance plan, right. you can keep that. How's that looking as if it's going to work out for folks right now? Are people well, going to be able to keep their own doctor and insurance plan? You know, they'll probably start with not being able to keep your own insurance plan. There's several stages to that. Part of it is uh, over time, uh, employers will be less inclined to uh, offer coverage, and that won't happen immediately. There's some pressures on smaller employers under the new regulatory structure and the opportunity now without an employer mandate to, to leave earlier. Uh, in terms of your, your health plan, though, because of additional rules that were put in to make uh, the older plans more expensive, as soon as you have to change anything, they're no longer protected under what is said to be grandfathering. So most of those will come under the new rules anyway. So you're getting a new type of health plan. And what's happening not only in the, the private market but also in these exchanges, the new plan you get will tend to be a more restricted network with fewer uh, choice of providers. So, well, what if I want a to, But what if I want a specialist? What if I have a particular disease and there's this great specialist in town that I saw five years ago? Am I going to right. be able to see him or her now? He, he, he may not be in your, your, your new and improved health plan uh, because either he didn't agree to take uh, lower lower payments or didn't want to kind of play ball with uh, the, the new arrangements. So over time, you're going to be more restricted in your choice of a physician or sometimes so hospital. Are you, are you saying that President Obama didn't give us quite the whole truth? Um, you know, it, it, it was situational truth. It sounded like a good story at the time, and that was needed for the political transaction. But uh, it, it was never probably intended to actually be done that way, and it certainly isn't materialized in that way. Tom, can you stay with us just a couple more minutes? Sure. Well, on part-time work, we keep hearing these anecdotal, uh, this anecdotal evidence that yeah. lots of companies, universities even, are cutting back mm -hmm. employees to 29 hours because at that point they don't have to provide health insurance. Uh, right. Do you think this is just more than anecdotal, or do you think it's been overblown? It's more than anecdotal. Uh, it, it, you know, the interesting marker on this, you just mentioned the example. It, it turns out that the most sensitive parties in this regard often are governmental bodies, where they're much more willing to uh, reduce the uh, the wages. And the like univer like employees. the University of Arizona, for example. Yeah, yeah there, my brother's and there's a large number of that. You can go all that. And some of that, there, there are sometimes state and local governments as well, beyond just the university. Uh, it, it's all part of the, the way the law was written. It almost makes an employer have to rethink, you know, what, what their business is about. They know they're going to have higher costs under what is required coverage. And suddenly there's this big beacon in the sky saying, 
But if you stay under 30 hours, you don't have to offer this expensive coverage to people. So whereas before it might have been kind of an in-between decision, now it's almost a, a survival strategy for an, any type of employer who's got uh, narrow margins and sees the costs ahead. So more, think about it, we also have the national statistics, if you look at over the last year or two, uh, but even in recent, recent quarters, the uh, amount of part-time workers who would like to have full-time jobs seems to be going up. A lot of the employment growth uh, turns out to be showing up in the part-time category. That's not totally unrelated to the incentives ahead under the Affordable Care Act. Are we seeing any evidence that doctors are throwing up their hands and saying, you know, this is really going to be a mess or complicated, maybe I'll retire early, or maybe I won't enter the profession. Are we going to see a doctor shortage in the future, perhaps? We, we, we've got some survey evidence. There's like uh, Medicare uh, beneficiary surveys indicating that uh, there's a, uh, an increase, not, not overwhelming, but, it, but it's going up in terms of uh, doctors who are not taking new Medicare patients. Certainly we've had a p problems for a long period of time, even before this new Medicaid expansion has made it worse with uh, physicians being uh, able or willing to treat uh, Medicaid patients who get paid uh, much less than what they actually cost to be uh, treated. Uh, we've got also among older doctors, I think, less uh, desire to stay in this uh, new world. Uh, so in general, we're going to have an increase in demand. Government's pretty good at doing that, uh, but pretty much either the same or a slightly shrinking supply, which is going to cause major problems ahead in terms of well, access to medical care. Ostensibly, we're doing all of this because there were 30-odd million uninsured Americans. The numbers vary. And a chunk of those, maybe two-thirds, are going to have access to health insurance now. But what kind of health insurance? I've seen estimates that up to 40 percent of the people who are going to be getting new health insurance uh, will simply be dumped into Medicaid. Is the number that high? And if that's so, what kind of medicine can they expect to get? Because it's one thing to insure someone, quote, unquote. Yep. It's another thing to actually provide them real medical care. Right. Well, old Medicaid had a pretty poor track record in terms of the quality of care. Half the uh, doctors wouldn't see new patients. Right, right. Or, or the, the doctors you get weren't necessarily the, the, the top of the line, and there are all kinds of sorts there. Now, the Medicaid expansion was going to aggravate that even more under the first version of the law. As we know, you know, about half the states have not played ball at the Medicaid expansion after the Supreme Court ruling. So that's cut back on those estimates of increased coverage in the the lower cost, the lower quality uh, way to expand health care uh, coverage. But it still doesn't uh, help people in the states that have expanded Medicaid because in those states right, you're going right. to get that problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, if, if the problem is you, you've got a mismatch between what you say you want to do and what you can pay for. So the way we do that in government, at least this version of policy, is to uh, deliver less than what you promised, and it makes the, the budgetary picture look a little bit better, but doesn't help the health care of the people you promised uh, Im improvement to. So I guess my summary of what I've heard from you is, even though we don't know exactly all the details or what the problems are going to be, it sounds like we were sold a health care plan, and actually it sounds like a game of three-card Monty in a rather disreputable casino. Mm -hmm. Well, not only uh, you know, can they not deliver what they said they were going to deliver, but they've been starting to drop off some of the elements. As you know, there have been a number of provisions that have either been canceled, delayed, or deferred or translated into something else. So we're going to get kind of the uh, the, the further reduced rate version of what uh, was Obamacare well, 1.0, trying to you know stagger to the finish line. Two quick questions. Okay, let's look at it from the Obama administration's perspective. If they keep delaying and putting off implementation of some of these things, do they buy enough time that they can get through the next couple of elections and then Obamacare will be solidified in the American consciousness? Or yeah, that, is the, are these delaying yeah. things simply mucking up the whole thing, making it more difficult to implement down the line? That, that's a little bit of a, where the straddle is right now. I think their primary strategy, after all is said and done, is we've got a permanent law. <laughs> you, you can't blow it out of the water. So whatever we can accomplish, we'll call a success, even if it isn't, and we'll still be around several years later to do the, the follow-ons and the finishing touches. Now, clearly there's going to be some pressure uh, later this uh, uh, fall in terms of whether it's defunding or trying to hold things to the mats. Uh, and we'll see how that shows out. Ultimately, I think it's going to take a couple more elections, uh, the congressional elections in 2014, presidential in 2016. But to the folks who are in favor of this, they're saying, you know, we've already won. We just have to kind of keep it from being reversed. Well, Tom, uh, last question. As a hard-headed analyst, do you think there's any realistic way that Obamacare is going to collapse to the point where large parts of it can be gotten rid of or just simply forgotten? 
or do you think ultimately we are going to be stuck with most of it? We're going to be stuck with some of it, but not all of it. I think that, you know, those of us who have opposed to it and allies need to do a better job of saying there's a better world ahead in a different way. And sometimes we've done a good job of demonizing Obamacare without expressing any a positive well, way. Actually, Newt Gingrich way. made a very impressive speech this week. Um, you know, he knows something about health care, and he said, look, mm -hmm. you have to have an alternative. If you don't have an alternative, yeah. people think what you have will be even worse than what we have now. Right, although things will be bad enough that people will be okay, looking for an alternative. You. Well, listen, Tom, thank you for taking time out from your very busy day at a conference. And that's Tom Miller, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and my favorite go-to guy for health care. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, John. My pleasure.